This podcast does not provide medical advice. Please listen to the complete disclosure at the end of the recording. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Everyone Dies, the podcast. I'm Marianne Matzo. I'm Charlie Neverett. And I am so glad that you are. Please relax, get yourself something good to eat and drink, and thank you for spending the next hour with Charlie and me. In the first half, we have a recipe of the week, and Charlie has a poem for us. In the second and third half, we're going to share an interview that I did with Dr. Diana Mason about what led us to what led us to starting our work here at Everyone Dies. So, uh, Charlie, what do you have for the first half this week? Food and death. Ah. Uh. That's it. My, my section is finished. I food do, food I, and death. It's like, uh, what? I'm sorry, what? I do love food. Yes. I love food. Yes. And, I uh-huh. love food. Is, is that something you, you just made up on the spot? That little jingle? No, because if, mm-hmm. I, mm-hmm. if I was Oscar the Grouch, it'd be, I love trash. I see. Okay, very good. So food and death have a long-standing association. Every housekeeper had a certain recipe she could turn out at a moment's notice. And although not every cook was frank enough to call that recipe a funeral cake, some did. It was baked into the caring tradition we still observe, taking food to the home of a bereaved family. This simple recipe is both kid-friendly and crowd-pleasing, the perfect pairing for hot tea or coffee. The Kentucky funeral cake is like a simple pound cake and is still offered to the bereaved. Now, poet, photographer, and leadership consultant Sam McGill is our poet author today. Sam has this to say about the poem. There is something magical about waking up. William Shakespeare describes sleep as death's other self. And so waking up is like being born again. Likewise, as we move through chapters of our lives, we experience places of confusion and loss. A career reaching its end, a relationship that is finished, a loss of identity. And we find our next orientation. There can be a great sense of having died to one thing and beginning a new life. This poem begins one morning when the first sensation I had was that of gentle thoughts that coalesce from dreams. The space between dreaming and being fully awake is, indeed, magical. It has been called liminal, a time when our rational self is not yet activated and our deeper sense of knowing still informs us. Some of the wholeness emerges there, and I say we are in desperate need of that wisdom in our times. After Dying by Sam McGill This is how I want to wake up after dying. To slowly become aware as light tiptoes into the room. To have gentle thoughts that coalesce from dreams. Soft and fragile, then as clear and focused as the morning air. To know that after all the difficult passages of a formal life, I can smile again and look forward to the day. Knowing who I have always been. Knowing exactly what I love. And what those persistent angels have always wanted me to do. Mm. I like that. Me too. So please go to our webpage uh, for a link for the recipe and additional resources for our program. We hope that you'll follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and remember to rate and review this podcast. As a nonprofit organization, we always appreciate your donations because um, I think Sandy and Charlie are getting tired of volunteering their time, but, you know, what can I tell you? And our blood and plasma, too. There's only so much I can do, Marianne. (laughs) Please don't make me no more. Please stop. What are you doing? It's like Little Shop of Horrors here. Yeah. Uh, Please go to our webpage to donate and support our work, Everyone Dies. That's www.every, the number one, D-I-E-S, dot org. So for our um, second and third half, we're going to kind of run them together. Uh, I have known um, Dr. Diana Mason, who Charlie's going to introduce 
for a really long time, from back when she was the um, editor at the American Journal of Nursing. And uh, she's a dynamic uh, nurse and faculty person and leader and is uh, doing a radio show and web page um, podcast uh, called Health Cetera, which uh, we have the link for the for you for that in our our resources with wonderful different interviews and um, kind of keep you informed and and understanding what's the news, the analysis, and the commentary. Um, from frontline experts discussing the latest real-world effects of healthcare and health policy. And so uh, Dr. Mason had invited me to be on her show to talk about the work that we're doing here at Everyone Dies. And so we thought, you know, it's been a long time since we've talked with our audience about why why we're here. So we thought mm-hmm. that we would share that interview with you. So um, Charlie is going to introduce that, and I hope that you really you know, enjoy the interview. This week, we are sharing an interview with our own Marianne Matzo. She was interviewed by Dr. Diana Mason. Dr. Mason is a senior policy service professor, Center for Health Policy and Media Engagement, George Washington University School of Nursing, and program director at the International Council of Nurses, Global Nursing Leadership Institute, plus Professor Emirata, Hunter College, City University of New York. You know, Marianne, this this lady can't seem to keep a job, so uh, you, she, she's on the up and up, right? Okay, so okay, fine. But that, that's good. I'm glad. I'm glad you she'll know, be here. You know, what she's mm-hmm. doing is is like four like sh- four jobs at once in her um, retirement. Although she what's yes, the and, term and, she uses? She doesn't sure. call it retirement. She calls it. And I'm sure if she ever sees me now, she's now like, she's going to smack. Just, now, she, now she's going to smack me across the head. Here. Do I have enough jobs for you now? I got one more job smacking you across your head. And with that, well, yeah, we, I could just give her hmm. your your address, and she could come oh, smack you. Oh, please do. We're in the perfect. same city, so yeah. All right. So listen, we hope you learn more about why why really why we are doing this podcast and what led Marianne to do this work. Last week, um, I I was really moved by. My discussion with Dr. Rana Limba, she's a registered nurse who talked about her lifelong work on perinatal bereavement. You know, she talked about how in years past, a stillborn baby would be immediately wrapped in a blanket and removed from the birth room without the mother or father even seeing the newborn or touching them. Uh, It was sort of this protective mode rather than asking the parents what would help for you? What would you like? She was instrumental in changing this practice that denied parents choices in connecting with and honoring this life that was not to be. But this doesn't just happen with newborns. Death is inevitable for all of us, but our culture has been one in which until relatively recently, we did not talk about dying or even tell someone that they had a terminal illness. I remember in the early days as a nurse, I, uh, the, uh, it, it, the, the physicians would consult with family members of a patient on whether to even tell the patient that they were terminally ill. Now, I don't think that would happen today. Um, and not if the, if the patient themselves is cognitively intact. In fact, it's almost the other way around. The patient has to give permission to talk to the family. So um, I also remember that when patients were terminally ill and they were in the hospital, they would be put in a private room at the end of the hall and the door would be shut. Nobody would talk about it. Uh, people would go in only if they had to. Uh, it was quite isolating. It's It's really... Um, when you think about it, it was a very lonely way to die. COVID-19 has raised the specter of dying alone as even family members were prohibited from visiting those who were seriously ill from the virus. And so these concerns about people dying alone and how we talk about death and dying are still with us. And Dr. Marianne Matzo is a registered nurse and gerontologist 
who knows well our history and our culture's struggles with embracing our own mortality. She's been a hospice nurse and a palliative care nurse and spent much of her career being with people who are facing death or actively dying. In She spent time supporting their families and, importantly, training nurses and physicians and others in best practices and end-of-life care. And I'm really delighted to have Marianne, Marianne on with us to talk about this issue of death and dying and our own mortality. Marianne, thank you so much for joining me on Health Center in the Catskills. Thank you, Diana, for having me. I appreciate it. So, um, so you've lived this history as much as I have. You're you're in sort of a retirement, what we call preferment, Marianne, not retirement. <laughs> yes, preferment. And so, in your preferment, you're continuing to do work in this space. But you have lived a career. You've had a career of coping with and trying to change, as Ronna Limba did, trying to change how we think about death and dying in this in this society. Talk a little bit about that, about our culture historically and how we've regarded it and how that has played out in our healthcare system and healthcare practices. Well, you know, Diana, back in the early days of our country, we were an agricultural society. And so people saw death on a daily basis. They saw birth on a daily basis. Um, they, you know, saw sex on a daily basis in terms of what the animals were doing. And so these were things that were just a part of life. Nobody really, you know, thought too much about it. You were born and you died and you died in, in your own home. And if you couldn't eat or drink, there were no other options. And so you were to, you died. And then throughout our history, technology has, has developed. And technology has developed to the point where we can keep a body alive for a pretty long time with um, artificial food and fluids. Uh, people generally don't die in their own homes. They'll die in a hospital or in a nursing home. And you can live um, a goodly part of your life and never see an actual death. Yeah. Uh, never, you know, like we have uh, friends who the man turned 70 years old and both his parents were still alive. Wow. So you could get to a pretty old age and not be exposed to death within your immediate family. Mm-hmm. You know, now, because people are living longer and we have technology to help us along. But that's really a double-edged sword, Diana, because, yes, we can do all of these things, but the question needs to be raised is to should we do these things? Should we use artificial food and fluids in some situations? Absolutely. In other situations, not such a good idea. And so how does how do the public look at the options that they're given and make a decision as to is this the best decision for me or for my loved one? And, you know, we, we should point out that that surveys repeatedly in, in the last couple decades, I believe it's two decades, have said that they want to die at home. They don't want to die in the hospital or a nursing home. And, and, and yet we're still struggling with trying to support people in that choice. So, and we'll talk, I'm sure, talk more about that. But I, I, I want to go to your your own journey and how you, was there a defining moment for you? when you realized this is way too important, we've got to do something about it. You know, that's funny. I was in graduate school at UMass Boston working on my PhD in gerontology. And I really was thinking about what, you know, when am I going to write my dissertation on? And a friend of mine had said to me that she didn't have long-term care insurance. She didn't believe in long-term care um, she said that Jack Kevorky held her health insurance policy. And what she meant by that, this is back in, um, what, 1996, 95, in, in that area. And Kevorky was kind of very popular in terms of what his ideas were in terms of assisted death. And, you know, we heard about physician-assisted suicide, and we still hear about that. And I thought to myself, well, what do nurses do? 
are, are nurses involved in this physician assisted death? And so um, what I did is Zeke Emanuel had done a survey of New England um, physicians in terms of practices, not what do you think about it, but what are your practices in terms of assisted death? And so I, I contacted Dr. Emanuel and I said, can I use your questionnaire but with nurses? And then we would be able to um, compare that with the with the physicians, you know, that were there different practices. And um, he agreed to that. And what we found was that nurses were five times more likely to assist with a patient's death than the, than the physicians were. Mm. So then I dug deeper into that. So what's going on? Why, why are the nurses helping? Well, nurses are at the bedside. Mm -hmm. um, and so when that's happening, when that patient's in crisis, it's the nurse who's there. It's not the physician, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. But I also saw that the nurses who said, yes, I have assisted the person's death with, you know, their patients on medication, because people would stockpile their own medications. They were all younger nurses, Diana. They weren't the older experienced nurses. They were the younger inexperienced nurses. And I thought that that was really important to pull out because I thought, well, do they not know what to do? Hmm. And then that kind of got me into the whole thing about nursing education and are we educating nurses about end-of-life care and, in fact, no, we weren't. Mm -hmm. So this was like a, a, I finished my dissertation in 19, 1996. And so after that occurred and after I started, you know, doing some writing, um, I met Betty Farrell, and she was at the point of developing LMEC. And yeah, we should explain to listeners, Betty Farrell is yes. a, a, a really icon in the field of nursing in terms of death and dying. She's out at City of Hope and has been one of yes. the leaders of educating nurses around and LNIC being end of life uh, nursing education curriculum, right? Consortium. Consortium. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. And so she was at the point of like developing this project to educate nursing faculty, and um, Deb Sherman and I were at the beginning of writing a, a book, a textbook, there were no nursing textbooks at the time, um, about palliative care nursing. So if it's not in the regular textbooks that the nurses are studying, and there isn't a specialty textbook, where were they to learn it from, which in fact, you know, this was one of those things that they weren't really learning about. And so we really, I really focused, God, the next, what, 25 years on nursing education yeah. and in palliative care. And, and so nurses, uh, on the one hand, we are part of this culture, part of this public. Uh, on the other hand, we do see death more often, and mm -hmm. we think about it more often, and we think about how we want to die, I think, uh, a little bit more explicitly because of what we see. So I'm, I'm interested in how, where, where you think we're at first as a culture with death and dying, and then in terms of health professionals in the healthcare system, how far, have we, we've come a long ways, I would say, but, how, but yeah. where do we need to go? Yeah, so let's talk about where are we at today as a society, uh, in terms of embracing death and dying and talking about it and owning it, our own mortality, and then in terms of how health care helps or does not help with that? Well, I think we can look at our language related to dying and death. Um, you know, when, when somebody dies, we don't say they died. They passed away. Mm -hmm. um, and it, we, well, as a society, we'll tend to kind of, sanitize it and not want to talk about it. American culture in particular is a death-denying culture. It's the sort of attitude that it's not going to happen to me. It might happen to you, you, you mere mortal, but it's not going to happen to me. Mm -hmm. So I don't really need to do my advanced directive or I don't really need to think about what it is that I would want at the end of life. Mm -hmm. And as nurses, 
sometimes we're not any better at that as much as we see death. You know, look at, you know, the, the, the data for how many nurses have an advanced directive right. is not appreciably better yeah. than the general public. Yeah. What? So it, it's this denial of death until it actually comes about. And I, I call it the don't ask, don't tell mentality. Mm. As healthcare practitioners, we don't want to bring it up because it might, accept, might you know, upset patients or um, the, the other conventional wisdom is that, oh, they're not going to trust us if they think that we're talking or thinking about their, their patient's death. They're not going to trust us. Mm. You know, they, they trust us to cure them. Like, well, yes, of course they trust us to cure them, but they also expect us to tell them the truth, to answer their questions clearly, mm-hmm. and to help them figure out what to do next. Mm-hmm. And so that's the area that we're still really lacking in. And but let me ask you something. Part, but let me ask you something. Go ahead. So most yeah. hospitals these days, I thought it was a best practice and something that was monitored by the Joint Commission that accredits hosp- most hospitals, um, that when a patient is admitted, they are asked, do you have an advanced directive? That's true. And so you're asked, you, you get this packet of papers. I don't know if you've been admitted to a hospital recently, no. but it's a huge package of, of papers. And they say... Um, do you have an advanced directive? If you don't, there's one in there. Uh-huh. And that's the end of it. Mm-hmm. They don't say, hey, you know, because the Joint Commission only says you have to ask. Wow. It doesn't say you have to explain it to anybody or encourage them to fill it out. Plus, when you're going into the hospital, is really not the time to be thinking about your advanced directive. The whole point, and again, the language, is to do it in advance, mm-hmm. to think about, well, who would I want to have make decisions for me? Yeah. Um, if something goes wrong, how far would I want them to go with technology? Mm-hmm. So it was a great idea um, yeah. in, in its planning, but in its implementation, yeah. It's a, it's a blank piece of paper that you're told is there, and that all. Yeah. So I, I want to talk a little bit about Everyone Dies. This is your website, and it's quite interesting. I mean, you've got uh, a blog on it. You have podcasts. You, uh, you have resources. Tell us about why you started this and what what you want to achieve with it. Well, so... I, I, I was turning 62 a couple of years ago, and I knew I was going to retire. And I'm one of these people that always is like five years ahead in my life. <laughs> about things. And while I was still working, I said to myself, we need to work with the public more. Because since, you know, 97 or so in there, when the Soros Project in Death in America started and the LNEC program started, we have focused on professional education. And we have moved the bar in professional education, but we haven't moved it kind of as far as I would have liked it to, I'll say that, but we've moved the bar. Yes, a lot. So then you have to say, it takes two to tango, though, right, guys? Yeah. Diana, you know, you, you, you've got this one partner who says, well, if they ask me about it, I, I know what to say and I can talk to them about it. But the other partner is the patient, is the public. Yeah. And either out of fear or, you know, the notion that it's not going to happen to me, yeah. uh, it doesn't get brought up. Mm-hmm. And so I spent... A lot of my career, both um, working at the VA hospital in oncology and working at our uh, cancer center in palliative care, talking to people and explaining things to people. And they would say, hmm, nobody's ever told me that before. Now, you know, you worked in the field for a while, you know darn well, somebody's told them something, but it doesn't always click in. And sometimes you need to hear it more than once, and we need to hear it in a variety of different ways before it does click in. Or a patient will say, how bad is this cancer? Mm-hmm. And I would all, you know, I sit down with them and I say, well, 
how much do you want to know? Do you want me to tell you the truth? And they look at me and they say, yeah, I want to hear the truth. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I would go through it with them. And they would say, I've had so many patients say, you know, I've asked this, and I never got a straight answer. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, you know, when I retire, I want to be able to educate the public about serious illness, dying, death, bereavement, and, you know, as healthcare professionals, we don't have time when we're in the room with the patient. We have a 10, 15, 20 minute appointment if we're lucky. We have to kind of take care of getting the chemo orders and all of that done. There really isn't the time to go into these long conversations, especially if the patient's not prepped for it. And so I thought, well, how about educated consumers? How about people who can say, well, I understand about this. I need to know about that. Mm. And so we started Everyone Dies um, a year ago, April. We had been think- we've been putting it together kind of in our heads and thinking about the processes for about five months before that, but we launched it in April. And we're coming up now to um, 10,000 downloads of our podcast. Mm-hmm. So, and that's a lot for a very niche kind of program about dying and death. And so, people do apparently want to know and want to learn about what's going on with them or what's going on with their family members in a way that they can understand and in a way that then they can either act upon it, not act upon it, or be comfortable in what in what the decisions are that they make. So I want to highlight just a couple things that from from my visit to the website. One is that you have a book on death and dying for children, which I think is a really important resource. Um, I always I always laugh because people say you wrote a picture book about dying for children. It's like, yep, we yep. did. Yep, you did. And <laughs> on your podcast, you've got a podcast about dying during sex. And you were talking about the Rockefeller, uh, this Nelson Rockefeller, um, you know, yeah. who died during sex with a 27-year-old. Uh, so I, and it was quite, you use humor quite nicely in it, but you talk quite frankly um, and, and I think it's, it is that thing of that feeling of, well, how much should I hold back? I think it's, Marianne, I think it's this sort of remnant of you don't talk about it. You hold back mm-hmm. because you are afraid, oh, it'll, it'll bother somebody, it'll upset somebody, when in reality, most people want to talk about it. Now, my question to you would be, what about those people who really don't want to talk about it? How do you know? Well, how do you know? There's probably a couple things. One is they're not going to go to the website and they're not going to listen to the podcast. I have had some people, probably a handful, who will um, email me and say, I really like your programs, but I really hate the name of your organization. (laughs) And I don't ignore those people. I write back and I say, well, you know, it's one of those facts of life. Everyone does die, and we can pretend that that's not true, but it, pretending it's not true is not going to make it true. And so let's just acknowledge our mortality, because I think one of the first steps of, you know, like treating alcoholism or anything is acknowledging that something is true, either that you have a problem or that you're mortal or whatever it is. Yeah. Let's just acknowledge that we are all mortal. Yeah. It's not an option. You know, our language about cancer, I'm going to fight this. I'm going to beat this. It's like you can fight it. Maybe you can beat it, but you're still going to die of something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, to, I have to share that a, a friend of mine who is older um, doesn't, really like to talk about it doesn't want to think about it but i've Mm -hmm. i keep bringing the topic up around the advanced directive piece that you may not want to die but i know that you want to have some say over how you die and it's i Mm -hmm. think has opened up the conversation 
a, a bit with her. I think when people understand that you really don't want to leave how you, if you can have any control at all, you don't want to leave it up to the healthcare system. You want to take as much control as you can. Uh, and uh, I, I, I encourage people to think about those advanced directives and healthcare proxies. And if you don't have one, I encourage you to get one. Marianne, you probably, on your website, you probably have a link to the he- information about a healthcare proxy or advanced directive, do you? Well, we have a podcast about advanced directives, and what we do with every podcast is we have, you know, the website, the podcast is there, and then there's a list of resources. Great. So it's not, and it's and it's not resources, you know, like pulled out of a hat. We use, everything I do is evidence-based. It's um, vetted. You know, if you see it on our website, you know that I've looked at it and I've put it there. I didn't. Like physically put it there, Sandy puts it there, but I picked yeah. it out, and you know that's why it's there. And so there is a there is a podcast about advanced directives, and listen to it and think about it because we do. In addition to the teaching, I'm very um, I, I don't I don't want to get bored, and I don't want to bore people. And I started teaching when I was 30, so I taught for over 30 years in nursing, and so we use theater, and we use, we have a segment called Drinking with Death, where we have um, a couple deaf people who are deaf entities who talk with us about death. Um, we have humor. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, we have jokes that aren't, you know. Aren't always funny. Like that. <laughs> they're, they're, they, well, I was going to say they're like dad jokes, you know, like you go, oh, God. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, look, we're we're almost out of time, and I want to make sure that people know how to get to your website. And even though it's everyone dies, uh, it, it's, tell the exact URL. So it's everyone with the number one dies. It's e v e r y the number one d i e s dot org. And if you want to email me, it's Marianne, M-A-R-I-A-N-N-E, at everyonedies.org. And um, you can find the book. It's called Everyone Dies. It's a children's book um, that's available on Amazon and um, Barnes and & Noble. And you can also order it off of our, our website. And it's a really, I think, a really good option um, if you have a ch- if there's a child that you know who has lost a parent or a grandparent or a pet Mm. and they don't understand children don't understand about death until you explain it to them but as adults we don't want to explain it to them because we're not comfortable we're not sure exactly how to explain it to them so what we've done is we've given you the words in this story of how to talk to children about death and it's very simple and you can do it and um Children, children like the book yeah. because it's simple and it gives them the answer to the question they wanted to know. And I want to encourage everyone to go to Marianne's site. Everyone dies with one being the number one dot org. Everyone dies. Lots of resources on that website, including uh, care of people who are dying and other kinds of resources. And and I encourage people to look at. We could, we didn't get to talk about your team, but if you look at the team of people who work on this website and and the materials that are there they all have their story and it's all people who really care about this issue so Mm -hmm. uh, marianne matzo dr marianne matzo registered nurse nurse extraordinaire uh thank you so (laughs) much for thank you so much for coming on to health center in the cat skills today and talking to us about this important topic well i'm so appreciative that you invited me my pleasure thank you Please stay tuned for future adventures of Everyone Dies. And thank you for listening. This is Charlie Navarrete reminding you, don't send me flowers when I'm dead. If you like me, send them while I'm alive. Aww. Mm -hmm. And I'm Marianne Matzo, and we look forward to talking with you soon. And remember, every day is a gift. Bye. Bye. This podcast does not provide medical advice. All discussion on this podcast, such as treatments, dosages, outcomes, charts, patient profiles, 
Advice, messages, and any other discussion are for informational purposes only and are not a substitute for professional medical advice or treatment. Always seek the advice of your primary care practitioner or other qualified health providers with any questions that you may have regarding your health. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard from this podcast. If you think you may have a medical emergency, call your doctor or 911 immediately. Everyone Dies does not recommend or endorse any specific tests, practitioners, products, procedures, opinions, or other information that may be mentioned in this podcast. Reliance on any information provided in this podcast by persons appearing on this podcast at the invitation of Everyone Dies or by other members is solely at your own risk.